Week 7 Understanding Roman Portraits We have a very good idea of what the ancient Romans looked like because they have portrayed themselves in a number of ways. In statues, on coins, in frescoes, and on tombstones. However, when we look at these portrayals, we need to know what to look for, as otherwise all that we see is a person-shaped lump, which is only interesting because it is so ancient. In fact, these portrayals can tell us a great deal about the subject. To find out about a Roman portrait, we should look firstly at the context. Why was this portrait made? In the Roman Republic, portraiture was a civic function. Statues portrayed leading men in the state, and there were very few statues or other depictions of non-senators or women in a public context. Those representations which were found were on tombstones, and we have fewer of those for the Republic, because cremation was more common. In the Empire, we find more portraits of men and women which were used for decoration and display, rather than as civic monuments. Emperors, of course, used their portrait as propaganda, as this famous picture of Augustus demonstrates. Though Roman statues are famously considered as warts and all depictions of their subjects, this view is not quite accurate. A portrait statue was usually made in two parts. The body was made by a sculptor who probably produced several similar statues at the same time, while from the neck up a specialist sculptor did a portrait head. This has led to some odd effects, such as a middle-aged person with the body of a heroic figure or the head of a woman with severe matronly features sitting on top of the body of an Aphrodite in diaphanous robes. Dress also gives some clues as to when a statue was made. For example, Republican togas tended to be shorter and more practical. But sometimes the statue's clothing is an affectation which bore little connection with reality. So a man dressed as Hercules with lion skin and club would not wear that outfit to the forum. By and large, people were shown on tombs in their best clothes, like this citizen woman of the 1st century AD, whose sarcophagus is at Ostia, near Rome. It is usually possible, and more accurate, to date statues by the hairstyles. Again, context here is important. Philosophers of any period have beards, but these are only shown on the average citizen in the early to mid-republic and in the Roman Empire after Trajan. In fact, we can see the imperial trendsetters here, with Hadrian, bearded, and Trajan, beardless. Just as men followed the dress sense of their emperors, so imperial women set the example for the rest. So we see here the short and rather unattractive style worn by Octavia, sister of Augustus, with the hair at the front in a nodus, which means not. With the same style echoed in this funerary portrait of an ordinary citizen woman. Note also the stola, the traditional woman's dress that was severe and unflattering in the Republic, but by the decadent times of Nero had become revealing and seductively styled. Under Nero's successors, women's dresses veered back to the conservative. This bust here is from the mid-imperial period, by when hairstyles had become more ornate and clothing more modest. Note that the join in the neck here is a later repair of broken bits. Usually, a statue head was cemented into a slot in the base of the neck, and sometimes statues were updated by simply switching the head to that of the current owner. Roman statues were painted, so the classic blank, staring features, 
of a Roman statue today are not what a Roman would have seen. The modern idea that statues should be unpainted was originally due to Roman and Greek statues being found long after the paint had worn or washed off. Frescoes and mosaics were decorative and showed a greater degree of freedom. Most pictures in mosaic are of mythological or whimsy, although illustrations are sometimes of gladiators or a charioteer, such as this one. The pictures in frescoes are sometimes portraits, but often somewhat stylized. For instance, an illiterate person might be shown with a pen and scroll, simply because that is an aspiration at which the subject is aiming and wishes to be seen. Generally speaking, with some practice and familiarity, it should be possible to look at a portrait with a statue, fresco or coin and quickly form an impression of the purpose of the depiction, the class of the person shown and the reason that the portrait was made in the first place. With more practice, the significance of particular gestures or items included with the statue can also be understood, but that is beyond the scope of this introduction.